when you're underwriting a property, you know, find a broker that'll that'll spend time with you, look into the property, see if there's any crime in the area, and is familiar with the area. Long story short, you could have two properties paying $500 a door here in Texas. One might be getting a, a good deal and one might be overpaying. And there's just kind of a, a variety of factors that need to be taken into account to, to, to kind of know that. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Sam Rust. With us today is Aaron Kelso from Ramey King. Aaron's a broker and consultant for multifamily insurance who helps investors through all phases of a deal from underwriting through closing, well-versed in working with a variety of lenders and their insurance requirements, um, which gives him the necessary expertise to be able to anticipate problems before they arise. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks for having me, Sam. I appreciate it. So Aaron, as we look over the landscape of multifamily, the industry, it's always changing. It's always moving. There's different factors that we have to respond to. But over the last, I'm going to call it five years, the uh, the insurance markets have changed drastically. I feel like I, I talk to my agent and my carriers about every six months and I have my breath taken away every single time. I'm curious as we get started here, could you give us kind of an overview of the insurance market and why we are where we are? I know you're based out of Texas. We own a lot of stuff in the Rockies, but as best you can kind of share with our audience what's happened in insurance markets the last couple of years, why are rates climbing like they are and uh, is there relief in sight? Yeah, so uh, there's no doubt about it. Rates are up across the board, especially here in Texas, obviously. And and this is mostly due to the the weather problems that we've had. Uh, So in Texas, you know, back in February, we had a winter storm that paid out about $15 billion in damage. We got the wildfires out in California. And then last year was, I believe, the most active Atlantic hurricane season that we've had on record. And aside from that, when COVID happened, you kind of have this supply and demand issue uh, with materials and labor that now your reconstruction costs are up. So there's been a lot of times where you you have to increase the coverage at renewal uh, to kind of keep up with where the market is to, to make sure that your clients are adequately insured. And, and, and not even property coverage. So yeah, it's also the liability. So we've had claim payouts increase over the years. A lot of insurance companies, you know, they want to avoid the, the cost of going to court. And so they just won't even fight it and, and they'll pay. I had one of these recently where I had a client and we knew it was a fraudulent claim. And the insurance company and I, I try to explain this to the adjuster over and over again. And the insurance company just kind of explained, look, it's just easier for us to settle, especially with, you know, court costs and that can go on forever. And then also, you know, the exclusions are starting to become more common where insurance companies are kind of protecting themselves instead of their insureds, which is what they were created to do. And, and so that's just kind of why we're at where we're at, uh, the weather patterns that, that we're seeing and also, you know, kind of the increase in court settlements over the years have kind of affected the rates uh, across the board. You mentioned exclusions, and that's something I wanted to quiz you about a little bit. In Colorado, we've seen an uptick in carriers who have a separate wind hail deductible. So it's not quite an exclusion, but maybe you have a a $25,000 property damage deductible, but you've got like a three or 4% wind hail deductible because those are significant events for us out here. I would imagine you're seeing a lot of that in Texas, but what are some common exclusions or maybe exclusions that are becoming more common that you're seeing carriers start to push out into the marketplace? Yeah. So uh, one of the main ones is assault assault and battery exclusion or even a sublimit. So essentially, instead of giving you the full million on your general liability, what they'll do is they'll, you know, sublimit it to, let's say, 100,000 per occurrence or or 300,000 per occurrence. And so as an owner, if somebody was to be assaulted on your property and, and accuses and sues you for saying, hey, you know, you didn't provide enough lighting on the property, you put me in danger. And, and I typically start to see these when the area has bad crime, which, you know, I use a couple of different crime sites whenever I'm, I'm underwriting a property, but every carrier is kind of different. Some of them will say, no, this one came back fine. And then another carrier will say, no, we have to sublimit the assault and battery. And then I'll try and get that increase for additional premium. So assault and battery is a very common one. Also an animal exclusion. 
that's another one that you know we're starting to come across a lot and uh, punitive and exemplary damages exclusion. And so if, if you're found you know guilty in a court of law and the judge wants to make an example out of you, that's that's why it's called exemplary because they're essentially they're making you pay so that others you know kind of learn a lesson and and don't do what you did. And so you know that's that's become a common exclusion. One that I've seen recently come up more common over the past few years was actually called a habitability exclusion, if I can say it right. This is essentially where you can get sued, a tenant can sue an owner by saying, hey, you didn't provide livable conditions for me. And that is now we're starting to see insurance companies throw in exclusions in that regard. And so you always want to consult with your broker and make sure that you're using a broker that that makes sure you're you're covered with these exposures. I can't tell you how many times I've come across people that didn't know they had an assault and battery sublimit or even an exclusion. Um, obviously, the policy was cheaper, but you know when things are cheaper, it's usually for a reason. And and then another one that I've seen is an insect exclusion. So bed bugs. There was actually a family out in California that was awarded 1.6 million dollars from a bed bug lawsuit. And so that sounds punitive and exemplary to me, if I were going to use those terms correctly. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does. But yeah, I, I did. I read up on it, actually. And it's, you, you know, it, it kind of just goes to show that sometimes those things that you think aren't really a big deal can cost you millions. And so you want to make sure that you're protected correctly with your insurance company. Yeah. You know, maybe we can talk to the folks who are beginning their syndication path or are looking to get into deals themselves. You know, there's a lot more than meets the eye that goes into insurance. And I think working with a specialist is part of the process, but there's a, a lot of these, these hidden gotchas that can that creep out. So when you're starting a process, when you're evaluating a property, how do you underwrite from an insurance perspective? You know, especially if you're, you know, you have an LOI on it, you don't have any loss run data, anything like that. You're kind of just working with what you can find in the public domain. Where do you encourage people to do their due diligence as far as researching your insurance costs ahead of time? My number one answer to this is is don't find a broker, find somebody that that kind of specializes in in your area. And they can kind of help do the underwriting for you. I, I see a lot of investors that will use, you know, a per door number in their underwriting or even go off of the seller's T12 number. No, don't well, do that. Don't do that. <laughs> and I've seen it. I've seen it. And here in Texas, that's after that freeze, what somebody paid 12 months ago is not what you're going to pay the next 12 months. I'm quoting one right now where the guy, the seller, took a 10% win hail deductible to significantly lower his premium, which was a smart, which it was a smart gamble on his end because he was able to increase his NOI and increase the value of his property. You know, he lowered his insurance cost significantly. And, and so you really never know, you know, what the how the seller might be insured or if they might be significantly underinsured. I've also come across situations in, in that regard. But it, So here in Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, in, in all of Texas, I know the rates, you know, like the back of my mind, you know, if somebody reaches out to me on a property in Des Moines, Iowa, okay, I don't insure anything in, in Des Moines, Iowa, but I can always call my underwriters and say, hey, you know, 1985 year built, um, assume no claims, what kind of rates are you kind of looking at? And then I can give them a solid ballpark estimate on, on what they're going to pay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of high impact areas generally. You know, we're talking the flood zones, things like that. But what are some other things that you want to be looking out for just in a general area when you're moving in and looking at crime is something you've mentioned? Any other items that folks should pay attention to? Yeah. So crime and flood zones are are kind of the, the main ones and, and obviously claims, claims in the area. If you know certain areas are are known to get hit by hail more often, or if you're in Oklahoma and you might be dealing with an, an F5 tornado, and and that kind of goes to, back to my point of why you should always use a specialist. 
if you're moving into Phoenix, Arizona, Sam, uh, every insurance broker is going to have a competitive carrier for Phoenix, Arizona, because they don't have any weather problems. Try, try Dallas, uh, try North Texas, or try Oklahoma or even Florida. Now it's, it's kind of a different story where you, you want to be working with someone that is kind of studying it day to day and kind of knows who the main players are. But crime is a huge one. Crime is definitely one that you, you know, always want to be on the lookout for because not only is it going to impact your liability rates, it's also going to, it, it also might lead to the insurance company trying to exclude certain coverages. So. You mentioned earlier that there's a couple of places that you go to look up crime statistics. And I know that insurance carriers vary, but generally, what are some of the statistics that they care about? And could you share any of those resources with our audience that they might be able to use in their research? Yeah, absolutely. So one is called communitycrimemap.com is the main one that I use. And then also bestplaces.net slash find. Okay. Yeah. So community crime map and bestplaces.net are kind of my two go-to options uh, where I look for crime. And, and that could be anything. That could be that could be a robbery, an assault, even a murder. A lot of times if I'm underwriting a property, I'll, I'll Google the name of the apartment complex and I'll say shooting after it. And I'll try and kind of find something. And there was one I quoted in San Antonio that actually had a, they found a body in in the dumpster behind the apartment complex. (laughs) And so, yeah, it always helps to kind of do your due diligence and, and, and see what you're able to find. You know, there's a lot of product out there that's lent on by the agencies. And I'm curious from an insurance perspective, if you know you're looking at a property that has an agency loan on it, can you make some really broad assumptions about the type of coverage that they have on that property currently because of the, the commonality of guidelines among agency loans? When I was prospecting like on Yardy and you see that somebody's with, you know, Sabal or Arbor, the, then I'm kind of able to know, you know, what their, what their requirements are. And that, that's a huge thing because I've had investors tell me, you're not going to come back to me and say, oh, your premium increased because of your lender. Sorry. And over time, early in my career, yes, that would happen. Some, sometimes you have to fall on your face early before you truly become an expert. But once you start to work with, you know, once you've done acquisitions with a variety of lenders, you'll kind of know, hey, lender X requires 18 months on the loss of rents coverage instead of 12. Uh, so I'll go ahead and make sure my quote includes 18 months. Lender Y requires a higher umbrella limit and, and kind of things of that nature where you can kind of be more prepared. And that kind of goes back to my point of why you should always just use somebody who does it on a day-to-day basis. Sure. We hate using insurance, right? It's there in case, but there are those moments where it comes into play. And sometimes it happens at the most inopportune times. How would you advise somebody if they're in the middle of a transaction and for instance, a building catches fire and maybe 20% of your units are offline and you're under contract. You know, obviously there's, there's the legal side of that. What does the PSA say? What's the casualty clause, et cetera. But just as you're trying to figure out damages and insurance and is the claim assignable, is there anything from an insurer's perspective that you would advise people to look for or engage in as they're trying to just figure out that process? Well, A, um, an open claim is a deal killer for a lot of carriers, especially depending on the size. So what I would definitely advise is see if that carrier will agree to stay on the property for the buyer, the same carrier that insured for the seller. That's the first thing I would advise. Now, regarding the proceeds, if, if that's not the case... It's, it, it'll, it'll probably push your closing, but you're going to want to look into having that claim closed before you take ownership. Because we all have carriers that will quote with open claims, but your first year insurance costs you know, might skyrocket just because of that one open claim. And I've, I've had situations where proceeds were given to the buyer to, to, to make the repairs. So I've, I've seen that before. But you know, typically, you, you want to make sure that claim is, is handled before the closing happens and, and it's closed. Kind of you know, what you explained to me, yeah, there are those very unfortunate events where you're already under contract and, uh, and, and something happens. Yeah, that's why we have insurance ultimately, right? Is for that protection, for that umbrella, for the rainy day. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, as we get close to winding up here, Aaron, I'm curious uh, if you could share with us 
maybe some way that you've improved your business in the last six months that we could take and apply in our businesses? I mean, you don't sell insurance. (laughs) (laughs) Well, obviously networking, you know, that's kind of for, you know, for, for most careers, but especially real estate investors. I, I've realized the value that networking can bring to them. I've introduced some of my clients to some of my other clients, you know, and then now they're talking about working on a deal together. You know, that can be, that can be very helpful and just, you know, staying, staying on top of things. And, and, and another way that you can, you know, kind of improve your business is, is just, just put yourself out there as much as you can. And then, you know, what I've been doing is you guys can come off like consultants to your passive investors. I come off as a consultant to my clients. You know, I advise them, you know, what they need to do, even if that's not in my best interest sometimes. I've lost deals in the past because I said, you need to see if you can stay on that management company's master policy because with two open claims, I'm going to be significantly higher. I would rather lose on that one deal as the insurance broker than than lose the trust, you know, and and hit them with a premium, a quote that is twice what they were expecting to pay. So just being honest, upright, and always trying to consult people for what's in their best interest. I think that operating in integrity is really important. And and we all give that lip service. I don't think there's anybody that goes into the world thinking or very few people that say, I'm not going to be act in integrity or be honest, but that temptation is there, right? We, we all want to make that sale in the moment. We all want to raise that extra 50,000 or whatever it is, but making sure that you're doing it completely above board, completely ethically is, is very important. Awesome. Well, absolutely. really appreciate you joining us today, Aaron. If folks have more questions about insurance or they're looking at their policy and they just want to learn more about the that side of our business and multifamily, how can they reach out to you? Uh, so I can be reached at Aaron Kelso and that's at Ramey. And then our website is RameyKing.com. And I can also be reached on my cell at any time at uh, 940-395-6606. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today, Aaron. Thank you to our audience for joining us on another episode of the Real Estate Syndication Show. This is your host, Sam Rust, signing off. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the show. Please subscribe and share it with your friends. We want to help you become the passive investor you've always wanted to become, but also the operator you've always wanted to become. We want to be the number one resource for your real estate investing journey. But go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing in real estate today.